and welcome. I'm Sarah Lewis. I'm a faculty member in contemplative psychotherapy and Buddhist psychology. And I'm also the director for training and research at Naropa Center for Psychedelic Studies. Um, welcome to uh, Psychedelic Alchemy. And I am uh, very delighted to be able to introduce our speaker for this evening, um, Valeria McCarroll. Uh, PhD LMFT is a consciousness guide. She teaches somatic and transpersonal psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies and serves as the embodied wisdom advisor for the Synthesis Institute. Immersed in the field of psychedelic work for over a decade, Valeria holds certificates from CIAS's Certificate in Psychedelic Therapies and Research and the MAPS MDMA Therapy Training Program. Her interests lie at the intersection of non-dual wisdom traditions, somatics, psychedelics, and social and transformative justice. Valeria stewards a body of offerings called somadelics. She lives in Northern California with her husband and daughter, and when not synthesizing and refining liberative systems for deconstructing the patriarchy, she enjoys playing outdoors and creating beauty. So I'm so thrilled um, to hear Valeria speak this evening on the topic of embodying a path of awakening, psychedelic mysticism, social justice, and non-dual thought. Mm, thank you all so much for having me here. Um, it's really fun to see some, some names I know and some names I don't uh, in, the, in the participant list. Uh, maybe before I start, I actually just want to ground us, I know, for myself. It always helps when I'm coming into a big field to, to just feel my body for a minute. And I, before I even do that, I want to kind of frame that everything I'm going to be offering tonight is an offering, an invitation, and the relationship I want to build with each one of you is one based on consent. So if my offering doesn't feel resonant, please just go ahead and ignore it. But I am going to take a minute to close my eyes and invite you to, to join me if that feels right to you. I'm just grounding into, into the body, into what is present for you in this time and place and space. Just feeling, noticing, bringing awareness to what is true for you. Perhaps inviting just three simple, spacious breaths at your own pace and in your own way. If we were all in the same room, we could hear each other breathing, hear each other arriving. But here we're, we're connecting on a much more expanded level, literally. So breathing into the ground, breathing into the space around you. Breathing into the co-created field, knowing that I may be speaking a lot, but that this is fundamentally a, a group field that we're in and acknowledging each one of you in the position you hold in the circle, in your own time, in your own way, finding your way back into our shared room. So continuing in the theme of grounding, uh, I'd actually, by way of slightly further introduction, like to briefly situate myself. Why is this important? Well, uh, you heard a little bit about me, but 
I want to name some of my lenses and my biases more overtly. So you have a sense of how my view of the world is colored because what I'm naming certainly isn't the be all end all perspective on psychedelic mysticism or non-dualism or social justice. Um, it's just one little sliver of the pie. <clears throat> So as you heard, I'm, I'm a somatic psychotherapist and I teach somatic and transpersonal psychology at CIS. Um, also relevant to this conversation is that I'm in a cisgendered body, though I feel pretty identified with my non-binary soul. I'm also in a white body. I'm in a body that experiences chronic pain. Uh, I'm upper middle class. I am highly sensitive, I'm neurodiverse, and I'm a survivor of sexual trauma. I'm also a former initiate in a school of Shakti Shaiva Tantra, which some of you might be familiar with or know as Kashmiri Shaivism. And I've been working in the expanded state field for over a decade now, I think. So that's kind of me. Uh, we've situated me. I want to also situate us in our present circumstances more broadly. Um, you know, here in California, for instance, it's hopefully what is the end of fire season. And there's always this certain quality of anxiety that moves throughout the fall and into when the rains come. And though California's circumstances are California's alone, uh, the effects of human-driven climate change are worldwide. This summer alone, we've had floods in Pakistan claiming over a thousand lives and affecting over 33 million people. There's been undrinkable water in Jackson, Mississippi, catastrophic heat waves in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and Europe, devastating typhoons in Japan and South Korea. When I look at what's happening, I think to myself, oh, we're, we're living in a time of global cataclysm. So I'd ask you for a moment to reflect on what happens for you when things fall apart. What emerges inside of you? How do you respond? Where do you grasp? And where do you let go? I say all that in part because my invitation to you throughout this talk is to actually really pay attention to your body. I'll be handing you a lot of information to chew on intellectually speaking, but that all lands in an embodied place. And so just noticing what is true for you. I would say that we're living in the death throes of an old system. One that we could say doesn't serve most of us very well. You're familiar with it, I would imagine. We like to call it the patriarchy, or I like to call it the patriarchy. Um, even though I think a, a term like hierarchy that I just want to seed into the field might be more appropriate, that's based on an understanding of sort of power over power under master slave dynamics. Uh, for the sake of us all being on the same page, I'm just going to use the patriarchy for this talk. So the patriarchy, as I understand it, is the set of pervasive conscious and unconscious beliefs of white body supremacist, capitalist, misogynist, heteronormative, ableist, anthropocentric thinking that underlies most of the West. It's kind of like the Hydra of Greek mythology, right? this many headed creature who every time one of its heads was cut off sprouted two more in its place. And it becomes a Herculean task to deal with. Now, I share this in part because when we're talking about topics like non-dualism, like mysticism, like psychedelics, my sense is we have to ground them in the here and now for them to be relevant. Mysticism or non-dualism or psychedelics taken to transcendent extremes tend to reinforce the very paradigm of patriarchal thinking that divorces matter from spirit and mind from body. So grounding such expansive thinking in questions as to how the world is made a genuinely more equitable and just place for all beings is the container and the parameters I'd like to put in place for this conversation. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I love wringing the patriarchy out to dry. There's that sort of inner aspect of my own wrathful divine feminine that loves nothing more than a good meme or social media comment that just slays like a flaming sword. And it's completely tempting to blame it on the patriarchy, to point a finger and say, it's your fault things are like this. It's easy that way and fair. 
right? That the patriarchy is responsible for the denigration of bodies, women, people of color, disabled, queer, and non-binary folk. It's the justification for the exploitation of the earth as an object we can own and profit from. Just think of that term natural resources. Its orientation lies behind the adamant refusal of so many to acknowledge the generations of violence, rape, and abuse of white-bodied people against black-bodied people and bodies of color. So at its base, patriarchy is a system of logic. It's a paradigm, right? a, a model or a pattern. And as a system of logic, patriarchy is a form of hierarchical dualism. So hierarchical dualism is a belief system in which reality has two fundamental components that are irrefutably separated. That's dualism at its base. And then the hierarchy is that one of those parts is more valuable than the other. Dualism stands in contrast to something like monism that holds that all of reality is fundamentally interconnected, one thing at its base. So as a form of hierarchical dualism, the patriarchy holds a particular set of belief systems or rules. First, that there's a self that's separate and that self is more valuable than the other. The masculine is more valuable than the feminine. The mind is more valuable than the body. Rationality is more valuable than feeling and human is more valuable than nature. When I think of myself as fundamentally separate from, as distinctly disconnected from the other bodies with whom I share space, from the land on which I walk and live, from the animals and plants who populate the earth around me, it becomes easy to justify my exploitation and devaluation of them. When I orient to skin that looks different from my own as the other, and I have a vested interest in myself as fundamentally good, what choice? does the other have but to be cast in the role of fundamentally evil in my mindset? So this set of beliefs underlies our systems of government, our scientific community, our understanding of health and our ways of relating with each other. I also just want to acknowledge that I'm painting a pretty black and white picture of the scenario when it comes to dualism and non-dualism here because there are many folks, wonderful people out there who ascribe to dualistic thinking, who don't cause harm or proliferate trauma. And there are many believers of monism or non-dualism who weaponize it in service of harming others. So to me, it's as much about how one's orientation to the world is actualized as it is about the theoretical beliefs themselves. So back to blaming our situation on the patriarchy. To blame what's happening on the patriarchy, that unfortunately would be to reify the beliefs that underscore the patriarchy, to separate the situation into an us versus them, black versus white, good versus bad, patriarchy versus whatever we are, that reinforces patriarchal thinking. So to move out of the mindset that separates and divides requires a reconciliation with the complexity of who we are. And Part of that complexity is the fact that the patriarchy doesn't exist just outside of us. It lives in our embodied state of being. Maybe I'm telling you something you already know. It pervades our bodies, our hearts, our minds, and our spirits. Those of us who've grown up in the West have been, consciously or not, inculcated into the patriarchal white supremacist capitalist mindset. And this mindset exists inside of us. This situation, is a profound trauma of disconnection from each other, from the natural world, and from ourselves. It's a deep wound. Or if we place it within a paradigm of non-dual thought, it is perhaps an invitation into our wholeness. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm, I'm gonna spiral us a different direction, but we'll circle back because first I wanna tell you a story. Um, you know, it occurs to me in thinking about something like psychedelic mysticism that I can talk about it theoretically, but really what, you know, what happened, Valeria? <laughs> Why do you think that? So this is one example. About a decade ago, I spent several summers traveling to the Sierra Mazateca region of Mexico through the mountains that are some hours north of Oaxaca to a tiny little town called Huautla de Jimenez. 
to work in ceremony with a curandera named Julieta Casimiro. Julieta, who has since passed, uh, was one of the members of the International Council of the 13 Indigenous Grandmothers, a group of Indigenous women elders, each from a different tradition, who gathered in service of upholding Indigenous practices from around the world. She carried a lineage of Indigenous practice, working with the psilocybin mushrooms, who were called in the Mazatec tradition, the Niños Santos, or the Holy Children. And there, on my second night of ceremony, during my second summer of work with her, I had a Kundalini awakening. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with that term, Kundalini is the serpentine energy of spiritual awakening long sought after by the ancient yogis of India. When awakened from sleep by the fire of spiritual practice or the descent of grace, it erupts moving through the channels of the body and clearing them of impediments and blockages and hopefully ultimately gracing its disciple with a blissful experience of non-dual union with the divine. So to set the stage a little bit, right here I was in Juliet's ceremony room, which is the basement of her family compound. <clears throat> and it, it's mostly dark because there the mushroom ceremony happens at night. So really the only light you can see are the candles that are on the massive altar to my right. Now the Mazatec mushroom tradition is syncretic. It's woven with Catholicism as a product of colonialism. So it's not uncommon in ceremony to hear prayers to Guadalupe, Jesus and the saints, Mary. The altar is covered with images of the Catholic divine amidst flowers and statues and photographs. Dressed in all white, as is honoring of the tradition, you found me that night in that moment in child pose, sandwiched between two other participants on a mat on the floor. <coughs> Excuse me, it's allergy season. <clears throat> so contemporary psychedelic work speaks to the importance of intention setting and influencing outcome. And earlier that day, I had been working to clarify, to hone my intention, my prayer for the evening. And I had found myself at an odd crossroads where I wasn't sure what I was calling in, what I was wishing, what I was hoping for. Now, declaring to a, a friend of mine my uncertainty, they drew me out. What did I feel I was being called towards in my life? Teaching, I said, some, some deep part of me felt called to teach. Well, and what exactly they asked me, did I feel called to teach? Tantra, I reluctantly admitted. I felt called to teach a kind of Tantra. Now, when I say Tantra here, I'm not referring to, I think, what many of us think of as Tantra, which is a neo-tantric, multi-orgasmic expression of unbridled sexuality and hedonism uh, that sort of pervades at least the Bay Area today. But when I'm saying Tantra, I'm referring to the non-dual ontology that comes from the classical non-dual Hindu form of Tantra, which is a very close cousin to Vajrayana Buddhism. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I was formally initiated into a lineage of contemporary non-dual Tantra. <clears throat> and ultimately, I had chosen to leave that school when the teacher and I disagreed about the place of psychedelics and spiritual practice. While I felt I had accumulated a fair amount of knowledge, my years of study and practice felt as though they lacked an embodied integration. So that evening coming into ceremony, I sat with the medicine, the mushrooms, cupped between my palms, cleared my mind, focused and, and prayed, teach me about Tantra, teach me about Tantra. And those words became like a mantra for me, repeating them over and over, teach me about Tantra, teach me about Tantra. And then electrical, there one second and gone the next, the bolt of lightning sensation that traveled from my crown to my sacrum was entirely startling and backwards from what I understood to be true about Kundalini. So modern understandings of classical non-dual Tantra say that Kundalini is an energy that resides at the base of the spine, not a phenomenon that emerges from the top of the skull. But in that moment, the thought just occurred to me, oh, I wonder if that was a Kundalini awakening. And so I waited for the fireworks that I had read all about and nothing happened. 
There was no transpersonal merging with non-dual consciousness, no out of control electrical jolting of my body. And so within a few minutes, I got bored and I decided to sit up. I looked around the room, you know, the only sound is Julieta chanting, and I stretched my arm above my head, then rotated my hand at the wrist a few times, and was entirely surprised when my fingers and hand continued to move without my own effort. So I would ask you, have you ever had the experience of your body being perambulated from the inside out by a force not of your own volition? It's really very surprising. So I lowered my arm and sort of stared in awe as my fingers danced to the tune of some unheard music. And the movement was sensuous, it was sensual, it was graceful. And it unfolded, extending into my wrist and my elbow. And I thought, huh, I wonder if this can happen on the other side. Lifted my other arm in the air, rotated at the wrist. And within moments, both hands were dancing in the air, articulating at every joint in ways I was unaware I had the capacity to move. So shortly after that, as my whole body begins to mobilize, I called one of the women assisting the ceremony over. And something's moving, I told her, and I don't think I can stop it. So she ushers me out onto the hardwood floor in front of the altar. And I spent the next several hours in a near state of constant motion, dancing to this silent music. My body was rotated in and out of asanas, these yogic postures, in a way that was completely transfixing. I'm asked by culture to define the borders of myself at the limitations of my skin. But the unnerving reality of being perambulated by an unseen force inside my own tissues rapidly undermined any sense of bodily ownership I had. One of my most fundamental assumptions about the nature of reality, about the nature of self and other, of my understanding of the boundaries of me, was being unwound in the most material and literal sense possible. From a yogic perspective, we could say that I was having a samadhi experience or an experience of shunya. I was completely present, focused, inhabiting my moment to moment somatic experience as it unfolded, while also radically expanded, far beyond the borders of my skin. Or perhaps another way of saying it. My kundalini awakening was a mystical psychedelic experience, an expanded state of embodiment, the lived transmission of a profoundly somatic experience in which two seemingly paradoxical and antithetically defined phenomena, that of transcendence and immanence, self and other, body and spirit, danced with each other. So if I can tell you one thing, I can tell you this, that the, the dance of awakening is one of making friends with paradox. Moreover, in both witnessing and participating in the dance between this unseen force, Kundalini, and my own self-expression, I never lost myself in the sense that there was a me observing and engaging who could exert and express will. My assumptions about spiritual awakening occurring on a transcendent plane outside of the body were blown right out of the water. The imminent bodiedness of the phenomenon was unignorable in a way that left me in a state of awe and wonder. <clears throat> so, as I rode these serpentine waves through my tissues, the thought occurred to me that perhaps what I assume is mine, my body, myself, me, I had never truly owned or controlled in the first place that my sense of self-entitlement and ownership emerges from an assumption of self as separate, of self as different from everything else. So as I understand it now, the events of that night offered an embodied transmission of the inherent interconnectivity and interdependence that underlies all of the cosmos. I remain an agent with power, purposivity, and intentionality, but what I now know to be true with every cell of my being is that I am not separate from nature. I am nature, a part of participating in, expressing into and being expressed. And perhaps what I identify as mine is a channel through which the cosmos, through which nature flows. And the immensity of nature, however verbally corralled or materially dominated, can never fundamentally be controlled. 
it can, however, be partnered with. So the story that kept wanting to tell itself afterwards, flowing out of my mouth to whoever would listen, was that Kundalini was wringing the patriarchy out of my tissues. My Kundalini awakening was a mystical experience. It was entirely somatic, absorbing in the presence it demanded, an embodied experience of non-dual union, the dissolution of separation between self and other. And what did I do on the other side of this fabulously somatic, beautifully bodied experience of ego dissolution? I went and I wrote a dissertation, which is possibly one of the more head-centered activities one can imagine. I spent three years of my life arguing with dead Indian men from the 11th century. In my return from my experience, I was so desperate to make sense of, to categorize, to cognize what had happened. And I was forced again and again to reconcile with the fact that what had happened to me did not make sense within the paradigm of Western science. The rules failed me. And in that moment, I was given a huge opportunity to see through their illusory nature. And instead of collapsing into despair or psychosis, I chose instead to deliberately expand my view. <clears throat> so here's the thing. <clears throat> Paradigms are games. They operate under specific rules. And it seems very clear from this point that the game, the big game, we're playing with the capital G, that we're playing, it needs new rules. We need a new paradigm. And my very strong and very biased sense is that psychedelics may be a potential keystone in the bridge that helps us cross from a paradigm of patriarchy and suffering towards a paradigm of justice, consent, and liberation. If we shape them intentionally, grounded in peace and operationalized with love. The shift I believe we need to make if our planet is to survive, and if we are to survive as a species, is toward paradigms based in non-dualism. The opera operationalization of interdependence, so to speak. So just briefly, so that we're all on the same page, I want to touch more specifically on what I mean when I say non-dualism. The tricky thing about trying to define a term like non-dualism or non-dual is that it's like trying to touch the moon. You can point at it with a finger, you can talk about it, you can describe it, but you can never really make contact with the moon itself unless you're an astronaut. So just keep in mind, I'm, I'm attempting to talk my way around and what I'm saying isn't actually it. I'm attempting to point with words. So etymologically speaking, non-dualism comes from two root words, non meaning not, it's a form of negation, and dual, which comes from the dva meaning two. We could say that non-dualism means not two, which you can then take two different directions, less than two, so one, or more than two, many. <clears throat> Non-dualism is the many in the one and the one in the many. So one way of talking about a non-dual view is that it's an orientation that organizes around the concepts of interdependence and interconnectivity. <laughs> So another way of explaining this is through one of the cosmic creation stories that comes from Shakti Shaiva Tantra. So in the beginning, going way back, right? In the beginning, <clears throat> everything is void. Now the, the tantrics say that everything is consciousness, right? Consciousness is the, the strata of the universe, the base of everything. But before everything sort of comes into form, first there's the void. We could call this in quantum physics, the zero point field. It's the field of non-dual groundlessness, of fundamental emptiness upon which and out of which everything arises and then returns to. It's the element of space. And space is fundamentally limitless, even though it's filled simultaneously with potential. So out of this space, something emerges, energy, vibration, 
as a form of light. And in Tantra, this is called Prakasha, the light of consciousness or the light of the void sometimes. So here's the light of consciousness, effulgent, and, and it, it experiences a desire, the desire to know the fullness of its, its own being, to see itself clearly. And so desire is what sets the light of consciousness in motion. And prakasha, the light of consciousness, this vibration right, in the field, folds back on itself. It curves to, so it can perceive itself, so it can look at itself clearly. And this folding back, this act of self-recognition, we call vimarsha. So the act of folding, you know, we don't always just look directly at ourselves and perceive ourselves. Sometimes we sort of go on a little, a little journey in that process. And, and so this sine wave that's created by the dance of Prakasha and Vimarsha, this is called Spanda. And Spanda, Spanda is the dance of consciousness in its spiraling desire to know the fullness of itself. Spanda is the heartbeat of the cosmos. So sometimes Prakasha, you know, sets its will to know itself and spirals in. And this swirling motion creates a nodal point, a singularity in the field, a point of origination in which consciousness can self-reflect. And so here's the thing, right? We're in these fabulous vehicles of self-reflection. So you are a centrated node of self-reflective consciousness within the zero point field. Know thyself, says the Oracle at Delphi. And the, the work of the non-dual practitioner or the mystical practitioner is to know themselves as nothing less than the unlimited, constantly changing radical creativity of the cosmos the living evolution of consciousness, which is inherently material in its expression. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, that's wonderful, Valeria, but why would it be important or useful to understand yourself as the unfolding evolution of cos the cosmos on a quest to grok the fullness of its own being? And why is non-dualism relevant to psychedelic work and where does psychedelic mysticism play a role? So, <clears throat> One way of thinking about psychedelics is that they precipitate uh, expanded or altered or holotropic, or you know, the, the words are endless, an expanded state of consciousness. One's boundaries become more porous. A person working in a psychedelic state of consciousness is much more open. Now, this has a shadow side in the inner openness, we're made vulnerable to those whose intentions are maleficent or based in unconscious trauma. But to our benefit, the increased flexibility that a person in a psychedelic state experiences can allow a relaxation of the ego, the part of ourselves that governs our sense of self. So in scientific language, the ego is associated with a part of the brain that we call the default mode network. Psychedelics have a variety of effects, but among them is a reduction of brain activity around the default mode network. It's kind of like the big mute button on the part of yourself that makes a lot of assumptions about who and what you are. Now our egos can be disrupted in a variety of ways and on a spectrum of experience. On the extreme end, we have ego death. Psychosis is associated with a, a temporary or permanent loss of ego boundaries. Certain medical conditions, dementia is known to shift a person's sense of self. Yet, the most reliable triggers are pharmalo pharmacological in nature. And of those, most notable are psychedelics. So in Sanskrit, the, the ego is called the ahankara. Uh, and loosely translated as the identity maker, it's understood as the point of generation of beliefs of separation. It's the part of you that goes around orienting to what you're encountering in time and space. I'm this, I'm not that, I'm this, I'm not that. Our egos operate constantly, whether or not we're aware of them. Egos are incredibly useful as aids to discern difference, to provide container for a growing awareness of selfhood, 
if you see a bus barreling down the street, it's really helpful to be able to identify it as separate, a threat to your bodily integrity and step aside. Our sense of separation is useful in navigating the world. I once had a teacher tell me that you need to have to develop a strong ego before you can transcend it. <clears throat> now there's a strong bias in some contemporary forms of spiritual practice toward obliterating the ego. The ego is thought of as something negative, something that has to be destroyed in order to awaken. Ego dissolution or the dissolving of your sense of self into nothingness is uh, often a draw for those interested in working with psychedelics. It's a key feature of both psychedelic and mystical experience. And to be fair, it, it's pretty delightful. You can sort of fling yourself joyfully into an abyss of nothingness and not worry for a while. While an experience of the death of an ego can be extremely helpful in understanding the spectrum of consciousness that's out there in the world and one's infinitesimally small place in it, I'm also here to tell you that liberation comes in many different forms. And the death of your ego doesn't mean the death of your soul or your observing consciousness or yourself with a capital S. So you might imagine yourself as an onion with an infinite number of layers. You know, <clears throat> your ego is perhaps a particularly thick and smelly layer of your onion, but it's not the whole of your plant. What's often failed to mention in my experience is the deeper movement that can occur beyond the death of the ego. What happens when you truly integrate across body, heart, mind, and spirit, the transmission that your stories of separation are just that, the stories you tell yourself. What can be potentiated in its wake is the awakening of the self, the wholeness, the radical effulgence of your being. Psychedelics can facilitate a deeper sense of interconnectedness. They can increase our capacity for empathy. A wise elder and teacher I know once called them human fabric softener. We also know from contemporary psychedelic research the importance of set and setting. That is how the circumstances that surround a psychedelic experience and the intention and the mindset of the one experiencing affect the outcome of the experience. Or if that was like complete gobbledygook, in plainer language, you're likely going to have a radically different experience taking shrooms at a rave than you would taking the sacrament of the Nino Santos at a night ceremony working with the Mazatec. I don't say this to say that one is better than the other. <clears throat> They're just different. And there's a level of discernment that's required to ascertain what circumstance is appropriate for any given person in any given moment, for whom and when. Now, the same thing could be said for the difference between the research container in which psychedelic assisted therapy session might happen in a medical facility, as opposed to an indigenous ceremony with a curandero in the jungle. Which brings me to the set and setting of our current research. Research is, for the moment, the way in which psychedelics are coming into mainstream view in the West. And I wanna acknowledge here because I'm departing now from the huge body of indigenous practice that exists out there, in part because I think the way in which psychedelics will become available to most people in the West will be through the research-based setting. So as I'm sort of spiraling in here, acknowledging that the indigenous practices are over here and I'm, I'm not really talking about them as much. But as research is bringing psychedelics into the mainstream view, for me, it's kind of like this slow motion scene from a suspense movie and I hate suspense movies. It's nail biting and filled with uncertainty and some level of nervous system facilitation. Which way are things flowing? When I look at the Western paradigm of science in which psychedelic research is happening, I see a series of biases regarding the container of psychedelic assist therapy. Western science is, after all, based on the logic of the patriarchy. And as such, it has its areas of unconsciousness, zones in which the rules of the patriarchal paradigm cling, reductionist materialism, 
Only the material is real. We divorce matter from spirit. Rationalism, reason trumps sensibility. Intuition has no place in research. Observer independence, the researcher has no impact on the outcomes of the research. Now, while we know from quantum physics and sometimes evolutionary biology that that isn't true, and these assumptions don't stand up to the test of time, they remain profoundly unconscious biases in how research is set up, conducted, and digested. For example, if a researcher is a psychedelic-assisted therapist, aren't they part of the setting, the container? Isn't it possible that their own frame of reference, their background, their training, their own biases might come into play? Wouldn't the hours they spent in preparation during session and integration be a guarantee that a client in a highly suggestible state would have some encounter with a therapist's frame of practice? If not overtly theoretically, then perhaps in the experiential interactions between therapist and client. So let me ask, what would it be if the impact of the psychedelic assisted therapist was acknowledged rather than mitigated? What about the co-emergent field that's created between therapist and client? What about the multiplicity of selves we know to be true and how different selves are called forward into a relational field at any given moment? How can a psychedelic assisted therapist not have impact? So instead of making claims of non-directive orientations, we have to understand that our very existence creates a certain kind of polarization in the field. And that inherently creates a certain kind of directionality, even if only on a biochemical or electromagnetic level. I'm not saying that we want to make psychedelic assisted therapists the holder of knowledge or the arbiter of a client's healing path, not at all. Right? Fundamentally, we can never know another's experience or what they might need in the moment. Instead, I'm asking, what would it be to study the phenomenon of the co-arising field to understand how different backgrounds in training and factors in lived experience might contribute to different outcomes? Furthermore, <clears throat> <clears throat> when we work with work to heal trauma within a framework, that pathologizes, denigrates, and names trauma as a problem to be solved. What choice is trauma given but to be a problem? Trauma, depression, anxiety, symptoms of mental health conditions we're currently successfully addressing with psychedelics, they are in general pathologized and stigmatized by the Western medical system. But have you ever really thought about why? What seems fairly clear to me from my own work in private practice is that most of us manifest symptoms of depression, anxiety, or PTSD for very good reason. We live in a world filled with the manifestations of systemic trauma in a moment of global cataclysm. If you're awake and aware of what's happening, anxiety and depression and PTSD are reasonable responses. So as psychedelic assisted therapies come into mainstream view, is there room to consider other frames in which this work might be potentiated outside of the Western medical paradigm? Or another way of saying it, where are the doors within the current frames we use that open access to greater senses of empowerment and liberation? So one alternative orientation that I think is well-suited to exploring psychedelics and giving us relationship to something like psychedelic mysticism is a rites of passage frame. So that term rite of passage refers to a capstone ceremony that marks a developmental passage that an individual makes, for instance, from adolescent to adult. Rites of passage do a lot of things. They sanctify the work of crossing the threshold, the inevitable grief and letting go of an old shell of self that no longer serves, and the calling in and anchoring of a new identity. Now, historically, rites of passage were embedded in our communities and cultures. They were an essential part of the village. Part of the potency of a rite of passage was in the ceremonial field that was potentiated around it, the preparation for ritual death and rebirth. So in early human society, our rites and rituals and our, our cosmological orientation 
cast death in opposition to birth, not in opposition to life itself. Death was understood as a necessary part of the process of resurrection and change. Rites of passage and community ritual served individual initiates as well as the entirety of the surrounding community. While elements of a rite of passage may have been inner and individual in nature, the work of the community to hold and support an individual initiate gave a sense of shared purpose and weaving of interconnection. These forms and ceremonies facilitated by storytelling through art and through ritual served to anchor each individual into a collective narrative of what it meant to be human. So today we call that narrative by a couple different names, the collective unconscious, or I personally like the mythopoetic reality. So we could think of the mythopoetic reality as a field of sorts, filled with the stories we tell about what it means to be human, what it makes life meaningful, what this body journey through the cosmos is really all about. Now, in traditional society, it seems that likely that many of these ceremonies likely included the use of psychoactive plants. And the ceremonies of any community served to facilitate deep connection with the mythopoetic, helping each individual to find and create a life and a death filled with meaning, a life larger than an individual narrative, a life of participating in the ongoing co-creation of the human story. These are the stories that connect us and carry us. They serve to restore and replenish us. They gave our suffering and pain meaning and context. And in doing so, they illuminate pathways towards healing. So in modernity, these rituals have really disappeared from sanctified view. They've become primarily the prerogative of the Western medical system, as doctors facilitate our rights of birthing and dying through a medicalized lens. So lacking the cultural structures to facilitate the necessary death and rebirth required to shift our individual selves through age appropriate developmental changes and stages, we tend to seek them out in the rituals that we have, graduations, weddings, and funerals. Or <clears throat> we attempt to create them for ourselves in other less healthy forms. Mythologist and storyteller Michael Mead writes, when rites of passage disappear from conscious presentation, they nonetheless appear in unconscious and semi-conscious guises. They surface as misguided and misinformed attempts to change one's life. They become miscarriages of meaning, tragic acts, or empty forms and ghostly shapes. In the loss of the rituals and forms that connect us with a deeper sense of meaning, we've lost our human taproots our most profound sources of nourishment and sense of anchoring in a world filled with suffering and desperate for change. Yet, in the reemergence of contemporary psychedelic medicine, something fascinating is happening. When well prepared for and well integrated afterwards, people emerge deeply changed. Now, fundamentally, this is what a rite of passage does, right? It's the final ceremony that marks the passage of a person through a developmental event in their life. The final rite is the last threshold, the completion of any untended tasks of the passage. And once crossed, there's no return, a death and a rebirth. In the psychedelic research, people are having full-on mystical experiences, encounters with the numinous, touching a sense of oneness within themselves. So to anchor into and embody the wisdom of that interdependence that comes from an experience like that, that is a rite of passage. So perhaps one way of thinking about what can happen during a psychedelic experience is that psychedelics are precipitating contact with the mythopoetic. The narratives that people bring back from a psychedelic experience are filled with words like ego death and oneness and divine and that isn't to say that all of those experiences are pleasant. <clears throat> Many of them aren't. <clears throat> Mysticism and trauma are intimately connected. And the relationship between the mystical and the moral is a deeply complicated one. The importance of an ethical container increases exponentially when working in psychedelic states of consciousness. When working in spaces that involve eco-dissolution, contact with the transpersonal, or numinous encounters with the divine, 
The field that surrounds and supports has to strive for a level of impeccability that challenges those of us holding space to do incredibly deep work around power, eros, and accountability. <coughs> <coughs> So, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> there's an ancient origin story <clears throat> that expresses in themes and variations across a number of different cultures about a cosmic egg or an Orphic egg. Maybe you've seen it. It's often depicted with a snake wound around it. Now, there are a bunch of different versions, but the one I'm thinking of, which is kind of like the ancient Greek version of the Big Bang, uh, Nyx the goddess of night and darkness gets together with the wind and she lays an egg. And this is the egg, right? The primordial egg, the first, the primeval, the fundamental, the original, the originating. And then at some point the egg splits open and it's said that Eros in their hermaphroditic nature as the protogenoi, the first one born emerges. And I like that because then really it's love. That's the thing that sets the universe in motion. <clears throat> but what's really interesting to me is the phenomenon of the force by which the egg cracks open. And I've yet to find a good mythological explanation for it. And here I'm, I'm thinking of the original understanding of the word myth, not as a fib or a made up story, but what Michael Mead calls emergent truth, an expression of the stories that resurrect us individually and as a species. So have you ever heard of something called an egg tooth? It's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. An egg tooth is a small, temporary, tiny, sharp projectile that you find on a hatchling's bill. It's the implement they use to chip their way out of the egg. So, you know, are psychedelics the egg tooth? Are they the force of the egg tooth? Either way, they seem to be part of the movement that's cracking the shell wide open. Now, while this is supposed to be a story about the origins of the universe, we also know from quantum physics that the universe is holographic and therefore reflects a type of wholeness and implicate replicable order on one level at every other level. So bear with me and consider this as an individual phenomenon. If I'm the egg and its contents, we might think of my ego as the shell. It's necessary for certain stages of development and problematic beyond a certain phase of growth. A death sentence, if not chipped through with discipline and diligence. And you could call the, the snake that wraps itself around the egg a guardian, a guide, an anima or an animus or an emissary of the world that waits beyond the confines of the shell, whispering, inviting, singing to the being within. And it seems worth noting here, that the line between a liberative awakening, a joyful splitting of the shell and a traumatic event as to how and when the egg cracks open is a very, very thin one. To plumb in the depths of the transpersonal or the mythological necessitates a container that can hold the potency of experience when the egg cracks and primal life force springs forth. There's a spectrum of experience that runs from spiritual emergence to spiritual emergency and what distinguishes the mystic from the psychotic is not always entirely clear. So I cannot underscore enough the need and the ethical prerogative for a strong container around psychedelic experience when working in these realms, by which I mean preparation, holding and integration across body, heart, mind and spirit. Looking back at my own experience of Kundalini awakening, what kept my experience firmly in the realms of emergence and not emergency lay in my own preparation and integration, as well as the networks of support I had to receive, hold, and mirror back the transformation that was occurring to me. In traditional society, it would be the mirroring of the community after the return of the initiate from the rite of passage that would help them ground and anchor into their new fundamentally changed identity. So psychedelics can precipitate via their actions on that tricky default mode network, a sense of interconnectedness. They're, they're the cracking of the egg, right? Softening the stickiness of the ego that's so deeply attached to its stories of separation, forgetting that they've become a prison. 
So when we soften the stories of the I, the opportunity to turn the finger away from the patriarchy and back to ourselves arises. It's no one's fault because we're all connected. And it's everyone's responsibility because we're all connected. With the thoughtful use of psychedelic medicines, we have the capacity to break the shell of the ego open, to create the circumstances that birth us into our next iteration of self, individually and collectively. If precipitated within a rites of passage frame, one that understands that to touch the mythopoetic is to die and be reborn, and can hold for that transformation across body, heart, mind, and spirit, and works to prepare and integrate it as an opportunity to shape and create the world of justice, liberation, and beauty we know is possible, psychedelic mysticism has the capacity to be an enormous agent of change. Now, if I think of the cosmic egg on a paradigmatic level or systems level, I see the old paradigm of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy as the shell of an old ego-based structure that needs to be broken down. It's a death sentence for us to stay inside. And if we return back to the effects of set and setting on psychedelic experience, it seems worth noting that much of the research-based psychedelic experience is being precipitated in the Western scientific paradigm, one that separates matter from consciousness. And yet, the research on psychedelics and mystical experience steps out of, moves beyond this paradigm as participants consistently report a sense of oneness, a unity with all that is. Now, arguably this oneness would unify time and space, mind and body, matter and consciousness. So what if psychedelics are one of the forces rending the veil, so to speak, on our current dualistic frame of understanding? What if they're breaking the paradigm wide open? What might we learn about the nature of reality if we oriented to the information that comes through these mystical psychedelic experiences as data points of sorts, qualitative information that could shape an embodied understanding of non-dualism? What if we studied psychedelic mysticism in the same way we endeavored to explore quantum physics? What if we grounded experiential reports in feminist-based research methods? What if the training of future psychedelic guides included theoretical and experiential education in non-dualism? What if we deliberately sought out the frames and practices that moved us closer to a paradigm that supports, embraces, and uplifts every being? The thing is that it's a choice. Psychedelics are changing the world, but how they change it is in part up to us. We make up the rules of the game. And so we have to decide how we want to relate to them. If you walk in peace, you see peace with every step. If you walk in love, love is the path you light up. We have incredible lineages of practice that come with many of these medicines. And when I say lineage, I'm including the indigenous, the underground, and the research-based frames of understanding. They contain great opportunity in their gifts and great challenge in their shadows. We're in a moment of needing to think critically about what we choose to carry forward and what we choose to compost. We can shape the tools of psychedelics with love, understanding that lineage is a measure of evolution and that practices that work with medicine must be grounded in the evolving needs of time and place and space to serve true awakening. So then we have to ask, are we shaping these powerful, magical, mystical medicines as tools of oppression or are we choosing to co-create with them as agents of liberation? So there we are. Thank you so much, Valeria. Wow, Thank there's you. a lot of wonderful questions coming in. I can just uh, feel in our space, people are grappling with what you're bringing in and maybe finding some of those dualistic places in their minds and seeing how to you know, work with some of the ideas that you're bringing in. Mm -hmm. um, 
so at this time, um, people are welcome to uh, continue asking questions and you would do that by um, clicking the Q&A button. Um, I believe also the chat will be open now um, if that's easier for you. Chat will remain open during Q&A, great. So you have two ways to bring in your questions. Um, and as people are doing that, I might um, kick us off with um, a first kind of question or, or contemplation that was coming to me. And um, I started thinking about this when you were um, describing your own um, Kundalini experience, Valeria, and you know, particularly when you were talking about not just this experience itself, but sort of how you were working with it, you know, and what I imagine would be the days or weeks or years um, following that experience. And one thing that was very clear to me was um, it seemed like you really had like a trust in your own body mm. um, that there was some um, and you can tell me if I'm getting that right, but it just seemed and, and maybe this is sort of like with hindsight looking back that you were able to come to and find some real trust and, and wisdom in your body. And so I have a curiosity about that. And I think people would love to hear a little bit about um, some adelics and, and what that perspective is. And then I was thinking, um, you know, that for um, many people, um, the body is not always a safe place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I know in a lot of like psychotherapy practices and contemplative practice, there's this idea of like, oh, well, let's like return to the breath or let's ground in the body, you know, almost as if that's like a universally grounding experience for people. But mm -hmm. I think many of us are also very familiar with ways that the body does not always feel safe. The body does not always feel resourcing. Um, and so I'm just curious if you have any, any thoughts about that, even for people who are, you know, moving into their own psychedelic work, or, um, there's probably a lot of people coming in who are interested in, in serving as a psychedelic guide or, mm -hmm. or therapist, and they might be working with people for whom, um, that's the case. I'd love to hear any of your thoughts. Sure. I mean, uh, you know. Safety, it's like my bone to pick, one of my bones to pick when we talk about safe spaces and space, safe containers, because you're right. There are so many of us who walk around in the world who that hasn't been a lived experience. And, and so then we're like, okay, we're going to create the safe space. And I'm like, well, but I don't know what that feels like. And um, <clears throat> You know, I, I sort of two, two things I would pin in it. One is containers for me are made safe by virtue of the agreements and how agreements are created, um, upheld and like reinforce, um, like see safety as a relational experience. Um, and then that's individual because any individual in a container has to have done enough of their own inner work to be able to engage in their agreements. So how do we, you know, how do we move from punitive models of how we make agreements and reinforce them to transformative and restorative models of of circles and um and then and then the other the other piece which feels maybe a little bit edgier is um you know i i would assume for myself as someone who spent a lot of time not feeling safe in their body if someone had been like well you're just in a really massive rite of passage you know, and you're kind of in a death experience and kind of oriented me that way, that would have been helpful. Mm -hmm. um, because there, there are ways in which a rite of passage is not safe. That mm -hmm. is not, you know, transformation is a death process and there's a, an element of risk. Um, and I don't, I don't, I'm cautious about saying that because I don't want to in any way you know, feel like I'm not acknowledging the suffering of not feeling safe because it is an incredibly painful place to be. And, you know, constant hyper arousal of one's nervous system is extremely unpleasant. Um, but I have a desire to, to, I guess, in myself, move less away from safety and more into frames of transformation. Um, and, and then safety being part of the field that holds for that transformation in a good way, right? What's the difference between a traumatic experience and a liberative one? Well, part of it is probably the container that happens around it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that it speaks to something that many people are, are looking for entering into this work. And, um, you know, I, your words are making me think about uh, the notion of um, courage. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but, uh, um, we might talk about brave spaces and there's a lot written on that. And, you know, I wonder what a courageous space Totally. totally. Like. Yeah. I have a teacher who talks a lot about, you know, there, there is no safety. We live fundamentally in a world that's always changing and anything can happen at any time. And the only safety that one really has is like the power shield of one's conviction. So how are you choosing to live? You know, are you choosing to walk in faith or are you choosing to walk in fear? Don't say faith in like a Judeo-Christianic kind of mode, but you know, how do you, how do you walk around in the world? And really the the values that you instill and integrate and embody in your, your body and your field, that's your protection. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's move to uh, some of these wonderful questions coming in. Um, and there's a number of questions um, that have to do, I think, with what you were bringing in in terms of social justice and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not just healing um, for the self. And of course, that's important, too, but really thinking about our neighborhoods, our communities and, you know, some notion of um, planetary collective healing. Um, so maybe let's take this question um, from Emily. Mm -hmm. And um, Emily is curious about division, labeling, demonizing psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, and she gives this example of LSD was once um, coined as attempt to overthrow the government. So while dissemination with love and intention is extremely important, Emily's wondering too about the dovetail between modern Western clinical and ancient wisdom. So how then to legitimize and integrate into a sustainable support network, a larger societal container after the emergence, after that container is made within this co-creative healing process between client and therapist is exited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a couple different things there. I mean, the, uh, to me, the, uh, the dovetail between the Western clinical and ancient wisdom is such an interesting one of like, well, how do we, how do we come into conversation? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the dissertation I didn't write was the grounded theory of the psychedelic underground. Maybe that'll be oh, great. great. But, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, and it's such an interesting question of, well, how do we just come into conversation? And, and what I, where I am now is more and more, well, how do I practice that in the spaces that are available to me? Um, because theoretically, it's a really great idea that psychedelics are going to serve collective healing and then like, how do I just do the difficult work of relating to people across difference and power um, in my life, you know, moment to moment? And am I, can I be sort of constantly in my own process of uncovering patriarchal conditioning and working to unwind that and scaffold different ways of being? Um, and then how to legitimize and integrate into a sustainable support network, yeah. I mean, what a great question, you know, what's the community you build around yourself? Um, and it's, it's hard because we don't have the village grounded in place in the same way that we did in ancient society. So we have to sort of create our own villages of sorts and create our own people. And we're, we've been living in this insane time where we're all so disconnected. Um, we're on these electronic forms and, and how to be, be with bodies seems like a big question. I don't know if I have an answer to that question, Emily, but you're, you're touching one that's alive for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's also a number of questions coming in from people, you know, I think wanting to maybe move into some of the energetic quality of, of what it might be to exist in a, a psychedelic, um, mystical, realm we might say or what that kind of mind might be like or what that kind of environment might be like um chris has been asking um, a few interesting questions um, so maybe uh, we could take this one can psychedelics be the elixir of immortality meaning the medicine the source self or the doorway to another dimension for parallel experiences I mean, lots of people think that that's true, right? Everybody is. Soma was the 
the psychedelic mushroom, the Eleusinian mysteries had, now I'm forgetting the name of it, the ergot brew, mm -hmm. um, you know, immortality. That's such an interesting question because this idea that you recognize, you know, self in all things, and then you're less attached to your own mortal nature, but you still got to die. Um, <laughs> um, I think, I think set and setting are hugely important in that question, you know, and, and back to the, like, what's your intention? What's the container you place around an experience? What kind of support do you have to integrate it afterwards? Because I do think psychedelics can be very much a doorway to numinous experience. And then, um, you know, what do I do with that? Back to the, like, how do you live it? How do you walk it? How do you integrate it? How do you make sense of all of this and have it really shift how you are in the world? Um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, and Neil is wondering, what do you think about using sound healing modalities in psychedelic containers? So, uh, crystal bowls, you know, I know there's a lot of sound, sound bath. Um, any thoughts about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I love sound. So, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by sound and by language and this idea that the, the field, that everything is fundamentally consciousness or light or vibration or sound, right? In, in Sanskrit, it would be vach. Um, and that like, it's the spoken word of the goddess that brings the universe into manifestation and then calls it back out. And, and I think sound is, can be profoundly healing, um, both in word form and in tones and octaves and, um, my sense is there's a whole world there that is yet to be really explored. You know, we have sort of the, the single playlists that are happening in the research. And then there's a whole world of sound in the indigenous traditions that there, I think, is more research on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a very interesting area that ultimately would be well served to be explored is not just sounds that come into a person's psychedelic experience, but what are the sounds that want to come out and using sounding and mantra to clear the body or what are the, the spontaneous expressions that um, occur that help move energy out of the body, um, the energy of trauma or the energy of difficulty. Um, yeah, and I was really struck by the part of your talk where you were, you know, saying, um, why would we have this, this idea, you know, either that like therapists coming in to hold space for this work would be like neutral, you know, is that mm -hmm. like what we're aiming for? And, um, you know, I thought that that was um, really important what, what you were bringing in, not just as something that, you know, therapists or guides need to kind of mitigate, you know, of like, oh, I have to make sure that I'm not kind of like coming into the room, you know, mm -hmm. and we're very careful to say, you know, that that doesn't mean that clinicians are now the, the experts on, on what's happening. Um, you know, and I, at uh, Naropa in our training programs, we talk a lot about unlearning, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and how important it is, you know, actually that uh, the therapist's expertise is not actually getting in the way of, of, of healing work. Um, you know, so I think this is, this is so important what you're bringing in. Yeah. Um, maybe let's uh, sort of connect it to this. Let's take a look at Carly's question here. Mm -hmm. Um, and so Carly is saying, um, in leaving someone in psychedelic psychotherapy, have you experienced someone crossing that fine line between mysticism and trauma into the more traumatic realm? And then how have you dealt with that? In addition, if someone strongly feels as if they have learned something about the universe or universal consciousness that then turns out to be negative, malicious, or harmful to themselves or their lives, how do you dispute that? In other words, how do you work your way out of a negative experience uh, yourself or for others? Mm -hmm. Good question. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in my own experience and what I have witnessed in my practice is that trauma and mystical experience are like flip sides of the same coin. Um, and that there's a really fascinating article somewhere about, you know, that relationship, but my own sort of suspicion is if I think about bodies having a lot of different layers and having sort of an energetic body, mm -hmm. a traumatic event 
is a puncturing of that body or an, a wounding of it. And, and then there's a hole in, in that body through which mystical experience can subsequently flow, right? So um, I think if it, it is held well, often the integration of trauma um, comes through mystical experience and the healing of that. You know, I don't personally see it as my job to make meaning of what comes through for someone else. Um, I think it it gets very, very sticky if I feel like I need to be the the arbiter of what usefulness someone's psychedelic experience has. Um, so if something turns out to be negative, you know, well, I I'm not in charge here, neither are they, you know, neither are they, but what are they going to do with that? I mean, the, the world is full of difficult experiences. And, and so, you know, to me, it becomes about the framing of like, well, how does, how do I support someone in making meaning of this? How do I support someone in moving through that difficulty and returning with a greater sense of capacity and agency? Yes. The crack where the lights gets in. Exactly. Um, you know, so what are the frames that I have that might be useful in, in offering to a client? And then, and then what does, how does the client construct meaning? You know, what's the narrative that someone, someone does with this? Um, I am always fundamentally interested in the narratives that empower people. Um, so that's usually an angle I'm taking, particularly when someone's having a difficult experience of like, well, okay, so where's your power and your agency around this? How do you, you know, how do you move with this? How do you not get stuck? Mm -hmm. Not an easy thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. There's, there's also a number of questions here um, that are kind of bringing us back to, um, you know, maybe more of the societal realm and, and back into social justice. Like I'm looking at this question from Gaia mm -hmm. who's saying, um, how does the psychedelic community show up in right relationship with the indigenous communities whose ceremonies and practices are being co-opted and appropriated for Western healing? What is the responsibility, reciprocity, repair, integration that is needed for Western practitioners who are experiencing healing and a sense of reconnection to life. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that is an individual question. To me, that touches the complexities of all of our lineages and that I have yet to encounter someone in the world who doesn't have a lineage touched by patriarchal trauma. Um, so to engage in that kind of work, to engage in reciprocity and repair, uh, in a good way is to first go do a bunch of ancestral work so I can show up to the table without having all that undigested trauma be present in the field. You know, how does the psychedelic community, I, Guy, what a great question, like what community? To me, it's individual, like that, that we're getting into a question that's so big and so broad that it has to be broken down into well, what about this community in this place? What's, what are these people doing, you know, in their tradition of practice and medicine? And it is probably medicine specific. Um, I know for myself, I've had relationship with the Mazatec tradition. And, and so being in an active inquiry of how am I remaining in relationship to that as a person in a white body, how am I in reciprocity with that, not just with individual families in the Mazatec region, but with that culture and the movements of that culture without getting into my white saviorism or all the other complexes that like to constellate themselves. Um, it's a big, it's a big question. Yeah. It's a big question. And, um, you know, so important that I think people are all engaging in this and, you know, I like your response that it's really kind of a calling in for all of us to be doing our own kind of loving interrogation right so it's not just about like you know theoretical people out there you know but trying to engage with our own lineages um intergenerational trauma also intergenerational resilience you know i think um part of what you're 
speaking to is making me think that, um, you know, psychedelics can bring us into a more fluid sense of space and time, Mm -hmm. right? So the kind of healing that can be done, you know, even in the past and, you know, future and present, and, you know, there may be more possibility, Mm -hmm. right, for healing to happen kind of through lineages and communities. Um, So I personally am um, hoping, you know, that in psychedelic communities, plural, um, that there's ways, you know, for, for that kind of learning to come in more. Um, I'll add one thing, cause you just sparked it. Um, I think the training of guides is going to be a place where a lot of change can happen. And I would say that from what I've witnessed, you know, we have a lot of emphasis on what the research shows and sort of maybe the hard skills of how to be a guide, the dosing, the like, the very material, I guess, um, parts. And then a missing piece for me is, okay, well, where is the education in practices of restoration and repair? You know, how do you like, how do you do that with a client when suddenly there are racial traumas in the room? Hmm? What a good question. How do you do that in your community? Um, you know, and so, so equipping the folks who are involved in the field with a basic understanding of what restoration and repair looks like and practices to engage with that, I think is an easy, easy, an obvious um, step that we can take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I think we'll have time for probably just one more question and uh, maybe we can go to Rachel's question. thinking about uh all of us probably wanting to integrate what we've what we've learned tonight and um you know integration is it's almost like we all think that we're talking about the same thing right like oh integration is like so important in psychedelic work but um what is it really uh so rachel's asking um can you touch on the integration process um to carry over these transcendental experiences with psychedelics into transformation for both the individual and then consequently um the the collective yeah what a great question i mean i don't you know i i love this word integration because everybody does have a different definition of it it's so like delightful oh what's it for you oh cool i didn't know that um I mean, integration for me, I'll just speak for me, is a, a like a recovering of wholeness or a reweaving of wholeness. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see transcendental or mythological or transpersonal experiences with psychedelics as sort of little drops, transmission drops on, oh, that's what that feels like in my body. I'm a very somatic being, right? So if I'm in an expanded state experience, I'm like really noticing what my body feels like. And then in part because I'm trying to anchor in those places so I can remember it and then take it back out into the world and try to recover that. Mm. So there's some level of that. Um, You know, there are lots of different maps of integration. I don't think there's a be all end all one. Um, And there are a lot of really excellent practices. So some of it is, you know, discerning what one's individual art form is, what mediums does one work best for integration with. And and I think that changes depending on where you are in your life and what's interesting to you and, you know, what you're working. Um, There have been times in my life where integration has been very bodied and there have been times where it's been very intellectual as I'm writing this dissertation. And um, I guess the one thing I can say is for me, it has been helpful to keep it simple Um, in the sense that so much can come during a psychedelic experience. And it's like, okay, and well, so now I need to do this and 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 this, and and then I don't do any of those things because I'm overwhelmed. So, you know, trying to narrow my focus or Uh, laser it down to like, what's the one simple, achievable thing that would feel good to do that can keep me moving towards a sense of that wholeness. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's a very big thing, you know, but, but often I think the changes happen in the day to day and the moment to moment. Mm -hmm. Um, 
there's a number of people who are asking about um, if they want training of, of different kinds. Um, there's, there's a number of questions in here about that. Um, any final um, words or advice of where people might continue to learn more if they're interested in becoming a guide or a therapist? I mean, there's lots of different programs out there, including um, Naropa's program, but um, mm -hmm. any, any, you know, places that you would um, direct people to kind of continue uh, learning more if they, if they want to get into um, serving as a guide? Sure. Well, I, you know, follow where your excitement is. Um, I, I offer my own trainings, not with the hard skills of medicine, but more in the energetic scaffolding. So there's me. Um, and I, I don't think we've defined that term well either. You know, what is a guide and what does that actually mean? And what does that do? I'm sort of suspicious that we're like trying to translate bodhisattva path into guide. And I love that. Um, but I, I, you know, there's, there's an Europa's program, there's CIS, there's, I think over a hundred training programs out there now. It's, it's astounding. Um, but I, I think the easiest piece of advice I can offer is like, well, do your own deep work, start there because it, the experiential is absolutely where it all grounds. Um, find a good guide and do some deep work. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, where would people go to learn more about you, Valeria, and to connect further with you? Sure. You can find me multiple places. Um, on the interwebs, you can find me at uh, two different websites, valeriamccarroll.com or somadelics.com. And you can also find me on Instagram, somadelics. It's my, there, yeah. Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> Multiplicity of offerings. Yeah. Excellent. I'll be, uh, looking for you on Instagram. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. And um, thank you to all of the uh, participants this evening. And, you know, there were a number of really wonderful questions coming into the chat. And if we didn't get to um, answer uh, yours, um, sorry about that. And, um, but thank you so much for everyone's participation. And thank you, Valeria. It was wonderful to be here with you. Thank you so much for having me. Really an honor.